Good evening and uh, welcome to Viewpoint, the show with an attitude. I think we're going to have a very interesting show today. My guest is Noah Swartz, <laughs> uh, who is a uh, Rhode Island airship history enthusiast. And we are going to be discussing the uh, Superman building, officially known as the Industrial Trust building. And I'm sure you'll be able to glean from this interview a great many interesting facts about the Superman building. It's been in the papers. Uh, it's been under discussion for a number of years. It's uh, sitting there uh, probably not making any income. People have made a number of proposals which have fallen through. And it's time for a different perspective. So without further ado, my guest, Noah Schwartz, who I'm going to call Noah throughout this because I don't want to get my tongue twisted. <laughs> so, Noah, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Glad to be here. I'm flattered that you invited me. Well, I, I find your story very, <clears throat> uh, very interesting. I always have, as I've told you before. And I know of your efforts to uh, uh, interest people in your point of view. So, Tell me, what got you interested in the uh, Superman building initially? Well, I've worked with, I'm a fabricator, a machinist, and I've made brackets for aerial cameramen and aerial cinematographers for 30, over 30 years. And uh, a local cameraman told me that the Superman building was meant to moor airships built in 19, like the Hindenburg in the 1920s. And it made me curious. And there are a lot of um, rumors and legends, and I started to research it. And I was amazed at what I found. It was just so fascinating. And the building, indeed, is an airship, is an airport hidden inside of a building. And uh, it's the older, uh, smaller, older brother of the Empire State Building, built by the same engineering firm. And um, just the timing was different. Uh, when the uh, Superman building was built a few years before the um, Empire State Building, there was a, you know, the Depression hit, and so the plans for making it, using it to, as an airport fell through, and Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic, and people started flying around in airplanes. And When you say airport, uh, uh, people normally think of uh, a place with a runway and, and so on. So you're talking about an aerial airport. Right. Well, airships work different from airplanes, and they basically have to attach by their nose to something to hold them to the ground. And uh, the airship would have come up to the building, and a rope would have been dropped, and it would have, there would have been a socket at the top, and the airship would have attached. A gangplank would have come down, and people would have gotten off, and cargo could have been loaded on. These airships were a lot bigger than blimps that we see today are. They were as big in, in as terms of scale, where, where would you? Uh, a modern blimp place. could fly around inside one of these airships. The, one, the Hindenburg was big enough to literally be a cozy for the Empire State Building. What do you mean by cozy? It could cover the structure of the Empire State Building. The, our building, the Superman Building, is nowhere near as large as the Hindenburg was. And the Hindenburg flew over Providence every time it flew to New York from Germany. So it was a common sight to see airships over Rhode Island in those days. Yeah, I know there are still uh, film clips of the Hindenburg exploding or whatever like that there, and I, I wonder if uh, some of our viewers might recall that. I've seen it numerous times over the years, and it's it's fascinating. Uh, but what 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 these what are, dirigibles is that what they're called? What were they built for in in the beginning? Uh, well, they were there were. Count Zeppelin, who built the first Zeppelin airship, and the Hindenburg, the film that everybody sees of the Hindenburg is the last airship exploding. The Hindenburg was the 129th serial number airship that was built just by Germany. And they, they flew 
they were, in those days, people saw them frequently flying around. But nowadays, all we see is the Hindenburg blowing up, not what was going on before that. Um, and um, <clears throat> they were gigantic. They were, the, they were thought to be the only way to fly long distances was going to be by airship. Airships, the first airship that crossed the Atlantic nonstop was in 1919, eight years before Lindbergh did, did it in an airplane. And in 1924, uh, the, uh, a German airship that was given to the United States for war operations called the Los Angeles crossed the Atlantic also. That was three years before Lindbergh. So that was thought to be the way it was going to be. But these airships were gigantic. They were, uh, uh, they were all about at least 700 feet long. That's, if you count off eight telephone poles on an average street, there's 100 feet between each pole. That's 700 feet. And they were 13 stories in diameter. And they could carry tens of thousands of pounds of cargo in, in the 1920s across the oceans. Now, I believe you told me the original uh, dirigibles were built by the Germans to be used in war. wars? Well, the Count Zeppelin wanted to build them for war. Mm -hmm. there, were other, there were other airship people like uh, Albert Santos Dumont who were very much against using them for war. He, Albert Santos Dumont was so distressed by his airships being used for war that he, you know, he lost his mind over it. He felt guilty. But Count Zeppelin was all for war, you know, for making Germany, uh, um, giving them. The, well, that was his. That was how he tried to raise the money for it to to supply the government with a aerial bomber. Right. So essentially, they you would load it up with uh, uh, explosives and drop them on the enemy. Right. But what, ironically, that what ended up happening was the primary use for them before World War One was for carrying fare-paying passengers, and there thousands, tens of thousands of people flew in these airships before the war, and then during the war they built. I, 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 90 of them, and they were all gigantic. They were all filled with hydrogen, and they all went around trying to wreak destruction until they became obsolete because airplanes became better and were able to shoot them down pretty easily. Now, what was the original <clears throat> use other than the war use in terms of what, what, what kind of equipment and uh, would you need? You need, obviously, a tall building. Well, the, the Germans the Germans built airships, and they generally pulled them to the ground, and you just walked out mm -hmm. onto, the, onto the ground or brought it into a hangar, a gigantic hangar, and you got off in, inside the hangar. But the, the English were the ones that wanted to moor them to a tall mast, like the Superman building, because that mitigated the need for a ground crew and a big shed. Uh, but it was it, it was everything with those giant airships. Basically, they were just too big to handle, and they. So what? Are, what? Are, what? In addition to uh, that, would they need? I mean, you, you talked about a mooring, you talked about uh, uh, a way for the passengers to come off it if it if it's anchored way up in the air like that. Like everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with the, the top of the Superman building with the point. Right. You know. So what kinds of things did you need? to uh, uh, moor them and, and, and dis, uh, offload passengers and, and the like? Well, uh, there was a procedure when the airship came into land. Uh, the Superman building has a ring of lights around the top that, that have never been turned on. And at night, uh, if the airship was coming in at night, the lights would be turned on and the airship would follow the beam. Whichever way the wind was blowing, it would follow the light that would bring it into the building. Then it would drop a line, and it would drop one line, <clears throat> and that line, when it, when the building, it would have to get snagged by a crane on top of the building. Now, there were cranes on top of the building on the shoulders, on the 23rd floor. I think it's the 23rd floor. But they were removed. But those cranes, when the airship came in, they would unfold. They would snag that line. and. Um, then pull up three lines, and the airship would get pulled down, and the two yaw lines, like on a ship when it's coming into a dock, would get pulled side to side. It would attach. 
the gangplank would come down, the passengers would get off, and then hoses would be attached. The building has, uh, on the, I think the 28th floor, the Superman building has uh, something called the tank room with two gigantic water tanks that have never been used. There's, there's never been a drop of water in these water tanks. And that water would have been to re-ballast the airship. The giant airships used to dump water to go up and let gas out to come down. Blimps don't do that. Blimps just fly around and don't change their buoyancy, basically. But <clears throat> airships flew so far that they would have to vent gas and, and drop ballast to stay at a given altitude as they flew. So the Superman building can pump water into an airship. The Superman building can pump fuel into an airship. The Superman building could pump uh, lifting gas, hydrogen or helium, into an airship. Uh, the, the whole building was engineered primarily to, to handle these airships and with an office building around the center core, which was a structural device, a mooring mast. With regard to the Superman building, um what other amenities, if any, were contained in that building? Well, there was the uh, there's the gondola on the roof, the famous. It looks like a it looks like Haven Brothers perched on the on the roof. <laughs> that was the waiting area, and there was a. At that time, the building was built during Prohibition, and there's a wet bar in this waiting area. So that would have been a no-no if it were you know, normally in Prohibition, but that was international space at that point. That was like being at the airport today after you go through customs. You were in international space so you could drink. So you'd have a few drinks, then stumble up to the top of that tower on, I believe it was a, a, an elevator. Uh, I, I've never really explored the top of that building. And then 400, 420 feet in the air, try to get up this gangplank while the airship was blowing in the wind. Mm -hmm. So you have been in the building, and what, oh, yeah. what did you discover when you went in there? <clears throat> well, the oddest thing was the 26th floor. Uh, after I found the 26th floor was just a complete replica of the lounge of a famous airship that nobody's heard of in America. It was called the R-101. And the lounge on the 26th floor was all wicker, and it was just absolutely photographically reproduced. A, a reproduction of the lounge of the R101. So it was like being in an airship simulator flying over Providence. <clears throat> and th those rooms were destroyed. The wicker was ripped out and uh, pink marble was covered everything up. And, and, uh, and that was the end of that. But um, I was like, why would they do something like this? They reproduced, on ocean liners, they would reproduce uh, like the, the amber room from, oh, what's the name of that? The Russian, uh, that famous Russian uh, palace. But anyway, they would reproduce rooms in ocean liners from palaces around the world. So you'd think you were in this palace, but you were actually sailing wherever the ship happened to be. So it wasn't an uncommon thing to do. But that's what got me curious about uh, why they would do something like that. And basically, you, you you probably went through the custom house at ground level, went into the building, went up to the top, waited for your airship to come in, and then boarded it. Do you know how many trips were made, if any, and whether or not that uh, the pink room and, and so well, on is still now there? Pink. Now it's pink. It's a, it wasn't pink to begin it with. It was wicker and uh, just an exact photo replica when I showed a picture of the lounge of the R101 to a security guard, he put his hand on his gun because he had thought I had snuck upstairs. And I had explained to him, no, this is a picture of a room from an airship. <clears throat> and um, he thought I had snuck into the building. That's how close the reproduction was. And that's what got me curious. And then I found out the incredible history of Rhode Island and ballooning and that Kennedy Plaza, the first aerial photograph taken in America on August 16th, 1860 was of Atwell's Avenue from a balloon over Kennedy Plaza. That there was a hydrogen generator where City Hall stands now to fill these balloons with gas so they could try to fly to Boston. Or um, They were constantly trying to fly uh, as far as they could in these balloons and until they were able to put motor, <coughs> motors on them. 
Now, do you know of any uh, similar uh, structure in Boston? You say fly to Boston. Do you know of any well, similar structures in Boston? Well, the, the, the winds would just take you from, naturally from Providence to Boston. I mean, but everywhere along the East Coast, from Philadelphia, New York, um, Providence, Boston, there were, there were ballooning facilities uh, to fly up and down the coast. The problem is you couldn't fly back. Is, is there um, any evidence of this in those other cities that you mentioned? Get her out of here. No. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> All right, she can stay. Um, yeah, everywhere. There were, the, the, well, it was a social network, actually. Yeah. People uh, belonged to different, um, the odd fellows and the Freemason, more so the odd fellows. Uh, you, you know, when you landed in a balloon in some field somewhere and, and the farmers would come running, you'd give them the secret sign and they'd help you get your balloon, you know, packed up so you could get back to where you came from. But the stories about the, the famous balloonists in, in Rhode Island were the Allens, James and Ezra Allen. And the, the whole family were balloonists. And there are stories, the old stone bank. Uh, books have many stories about them knocking people's chimneys over and uh, you know in their balloons and disappearing for four days until <coughs> they get word back from that they landed somewhere in Maine or something like that they didn't know where they were going but they went and they actually the Allens helped Thaddeus Lowe start the Air Force the United States Air Force and there are claims that the Allens took Count Zeppelin who invented the rigid airship uh, on his first ride in a balloon. But that's only in Rhode Island do they say that. Everywhere else there's some other story. But I kind of like the Rhode Island version of the story that the Allens took Count Zeppelin up in a, in, a, in a balloon and inspired him to go ahead and build his airships. So there's just, the more you look, the more you find. You Excuse me. have done some thinking about how uh, the city and the state can reclaim that building. I know there's been suggestions of what can be done with it. And in fact, uh, people have attempted to put together a plan, but all of them have failed. Do you think there's a better use that can be? Uh, yeah, absolutely. OK. Absolutely. <laughs> I've been saying this for 16 years. And nobody, you know, they have their ideas of what they want to do. but. Uh, there's the, there's the observation deck angle. The Empire State Building makes more money from tourism than it does from rent. And people could go to the top of the building and see, as a matter of fact, the Empire State Building, when they built it as a dirigible mooring mast, they said, even if no dirigible ever docks here, it'll be a great place to see the city. It says that in the brochure from opening day. And no dirigible ever did really dock at the end. They threw a, they threw a, I think a thing of newspapers out of one, and somebody caught them, and that was about the extent of it. But our building would have worked. The Empire State Building was for show, and in the middle of the Depression, it was to build people's spirits. But our building actually would have worked, it, engineering-wise. It had every feature to actually handle these airships. And the interesting thing is, the, the, like the railroad bridge that's open over the river to East Providence, that's frozen open, the iconic railroad bridge. Was. It's still there. It is? I haven't seen it lately. <laughs> <laughs> that's be, well, that's part of the problem. The railroad situation in Rhode Island was so bad back in those days that these industrials were willing to try to ship goods out by airship so they could well, bypass the railroads. Railroads obviously couldn't go across the ocean. Well, the railroads, if you wanted to ship something out from Brown and Sharp or from Gorham or from uh, or Corliss, you had to put it on the train. And the train had to go to Boston or New York. You had to pay Connecticut. You had to pay a, a dock on, in Boston or New York to hold it until a ship came in and then transport it across the ocean. If, if they could have shipped things straight out from Providence, and the airships were big enough that if it was docked at the building, its tail would hung out over Union Station easily, and they could have hauled stuff up right from the trains, right into the airship. That's how, they were big enough to hold that much cargo. And the reason they were big was the larger they were, the further they could fly. So it became like a, like a math thing that they were able to carry this kind of weight. And uh, you would have been point to point. You could have hauled it up into the airship, dropped it where you needed to take it, and eliminate all that 
waiting and the railroad time and the docks in Boston and paying Connecticut and paying Boston and paying New York. And there were a lot of intrigues in the railroads. The story that I was going to bring a book uh, about the railroads and hold it up so people could read it about what went on with all the, with all the railroads coming through Rhode Island geographically. So Rhode Island was in this corner, elbow between Boston and New York, and stuck between these giants and and these people uh, that built the Superman building tried to make it so you could ship stuff out directly. What stopped? the progress in the use of these dirigibles. They tended to explode. <laughs> and they did. They did. Unless you filled them with helium, which doesn't burn, in which case they would just crash. They were big. They, they were hard to control. I think maybe today if you built one, you know, that, that had full of iPhones and stuff like that to control it, I think they would be, you'd have more of a chance of getting them to work. Well, basically, the problems with them were that they were too large uh, and they were very fragile. Okay. Let's, let's talk about the building. Uh, you've had some ideas. What, what are those ideas? The second, the Industrial Trust Company, that building, to me, it's worth its weight in gold. The Industrial Trust Company financed all these I wish I had the video of the cannonball safes to show. I mean, ah, yeah. The, I mean, somehow don't you look show. over there. Why not? <laughs> because you're looking off camera. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, but the second floor of that building is already set up. When you say the cannonball, uh, you need to clarify that a little bit. Where the coreless the... cannonball safes. Okay. Things like that. Have you seen them? Yes. Where? Should I say where? I don't want to. What? In City Hall, maybe? In City Hall, yeah. <laughs> but nobody knew about them until I stumbled upon them. And they would be an incredible thing to display. Should I get a video up on my phone? Or? No, no. We zoom no. in. We've, we've got some time. It's running. OK. Now, OK. But, so. but to put these things on display, products from Corliss, products from. Um, uh, so like a museum? Like a museum, the second floor of that building is already set up like a museum. Beautiful, beautifully done. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't take much to just get stuff in there. Of course, you'd have to reinforce the floor. You don't want the cannonball safes. They're heavy. But anyway, and then there's uh, my favorite company again, Gorham. Put things up. And then there's the American Locomotive Company car that they restored the buildings over. I yeah. mean, the Alco car. Uh, and, and uh, bring all these things together into one place and emphasize to people that anywhere in the state you can get there with RIPTA. Takes you right there to the Superman building. So that's the second floor. Then you have the top of the building for an observation deck and the, the gondola on the roof that, that I talk about. Um, and then on the 25th floor, there's a, there's, a, a rest, there's a potential there for a restaurant. You could have, you know, Food from the menus from the great airships like the Graf Zeppelin or the Hindenburg. You could eat the food that they ate on those great airships. You think that would really be tasty? Well, you could also <laughs> go for laughs. Everything you bring out of the kitchen could be on fire. <laughs> Cherry's Jubilee, things like that. Oh, the, oh, the Humanity Sunday, something like that. Uh, so your idea then is uh, to uh, reestablish it as a tourist Attraction. It's got to generate people walking through the city again. The arcade is a shadow of itself. I mean, people, there aren't that many people there. Before, you couldn't walk through the arcade. The arcade extended through the Superman building to Kennedy Plaza. That was kind of like the entrance from the docks, from the cat, from if you came in on the ships in the old days before the was highways. Was there a bridge between the buildings? No, you walk through the arcade, okay. you, cross, you cross Westminster Street, and you go through the Superman building into Kennedy Plaza. That was all, you know, I mean, that the, the was all planned that way. But the Superman building is, was an office building. And people go to, they, have, they go out to have lunch. I mean, you want to, there's a trend to turn these buildings into apartments. OK, some apartments. But basically, you want to get people in there during the day going to have, you know, going to get, get lunch and revitalize the area. And, and the other thing is, let's get going. They've already turned off the boilers in that building. They have a, a life support unit on the outside of that building to keep it warm in the winter. 
those boilers are not going to, you know, maintain themselves. They're going to have to be either scrapped or retooled. I don't know. You're going to have to get the people that know how to keep them running. I mean, a 1928 boiler is not something, you know, some, I mean, a new kit, you know, you'd have to get the people that know these things, that know the idiosyncrasies to keep them running. Or else you're going to have to, you're going to spend even more money to, to tear them out. And the other thing is that the vault in that bank is one of the largest vaults, uh, the safe deposit box vaults. I yeah. believe it's was it uh, 18,000 safe deposit boxes in that vault. I mean, just to see something like that, much less whatever they want to do with it. Um, there's things in the building to see the parts of the building that made it into an airport are still in it. Some, most of it is, is, is gone, but there's still some of the things that made it an airport still in it. And just the view and the fact that it's, you know, basically an airship simulator. You're in the, that gondola airship as if you're flying in an airship over Providence. So it's a thrill, but the things have to be done, and you can do it in pieces. You don't have to do it all at once, but just get interest going in the building rather than just having it sit there yeah. Like one of those, well, you know. What would it take to get something like that started? Now, obviously, they've talked about the amount of money that would have to be invested to retool it into apartments, into uh, workspace, uh, to uh, have it be uh, a dormitory or be uh, office space or whatever. They've talked about that. What, what do you think it would take to pursue your idea. Tremendous amount of money. I don't, well, look, I think if people knew what it was, I think that the, that would draw interest to it locally, nationally, internationally. Uh, if we did something different that wasn't like what they're doing with old buildings in every other city, which is basically repurposing them into apartments, excuse me, that would create interest. And I'm sure there are grants, there's crowdfunding. Uh, the city, I think, should be involved in getting that building open and getting some enthusiasm for it. But I think the key thing is, but primarily, is people should know what that building is. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's, there's nothing like it in the universe. There's. Well, I and Rhode, hope. it's something that it's it's proud of the building is proud of Rhode Island and its accomplishments, and that bank was that financed all these great companies, and Rhode Island should be proud of that building. Well, I hope this show is going to enlighten some people into thinking about that. Obviously, it's not something that you could do yourself, you being so wealthy. <laughs> but Jackie, it's it's, 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 it's entirely. Um, uh, it's very interesting, the whole history of it and uh, the knowledge that you've gained from uh, researching it. And I, uh, I hope uh, this can be a catalyst for some further thought uh, to it. Doesn't hurt to talk. Yeah. Superman building. Maybe we can have Superman come back from Krypton just to do the opening. Uh, but uh, <laughs> all publicity is good publicity. <laughs> Just don't okay. get it all like Times Square. Unfortunately, we've we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank everyone from wa for watching, and uh, perhaps we'll have uh, Mr. Noah Schwartz back again to talk about further developments with us. So uh, don't forget that we have a commentary page on Facebook. It's called Viewpoint with Tom O'Connor. I appreciate any feedback that you give. So today, uh, I think it's been interesting and it's just uh, a little touch of what we could talk about with this building. So have a good evening and uh, tune in again.